Welcome to session five of Perception, Fear, and Media, Roots of Polarization. This session focuses on understanding fear-based thinking. Um, fear-based thinking is a term that summarizes what happens when our short-term reaction to fear becomes embedded into our brain and actually into our body too, because the buildup of tension uh, is part of that. So it becomes a habit that affects how we see each other in our world and how we think about things and how we receive information. It limits the information we're able to take in, limits our way of processing it, and limits our, our ability to respond uh, clearly and effectively. So fear-based thinking narrows and shrinks our frames, it colors and darkens our emotional filters, and it fixes and fragments our focus. So fear in nature is a brief reaction to an immediate threat. And it's helpful to understand what's going on there uh, to get a, a, an idea of what's underneath fear-based thinking. So it creates a surge of energy, okay? And that helps us to fight or run away from whatever that threat might be. Uh, that's how animals and nature's respond to it. And that's our nature as well. So it also narrows our focus on the threat. We don't ask questions or take in information if we're being chased by a bear, we just get away from the bear. We don't care what's going on or where we're going, what we step on and in we're focused on getting away from the bear and getting safe, okay? So it creates what's called, again, the fight or flight response. And it's helpful to get a little bit of detail on that to, to understand how it works and what's happening. So it's, risk is regulated by the autonomic nervous system. There's two parts to that nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system activates the muscles. The parasympathetic nervous system essentially does maintenance work. And those work opposite each other. They're never both on at the same time. One's on, the other's off. Okay, so you don't eat a big, huge meal and then go out and run five miles. So the meal is not going to stay down there. Okay, so what happens when we experience fear and perceive a threat is a sympathetic nervous system gets activated. So we have the energy to run or fight. Um, and so if we're dealing with that, as animals do in nature, that energy is discharged. But in the human threats, uh, we don't respond to them by fighting or running. So that builds up tension. And that tension creates a problem because it draws our mind to what's wrong. So the threat might be somewhere distant or in the future or even thinking about something in the past. But when we're thinking about it, perception is a re or emotion as a result of perception. So that creates more fear, which narrows our focus more on threats and creates more fear and then kind of creates a self-escalating process. Uh, it's not a huge problem in the short term. In the long term, when there's prolonged fear or if there's a severe trauma that, that creates a, a, a prolonged fear reaction, uh, then stress hormones are, ble are released into the bloodstream. So if we're being chased by a bear and we start to get tired, we can't just call time out and say, okay, let me rest and uh, then we can resume. We gotta keep going. So what happens is, is our body produces these stress hormones that keep the sympathetic nervous system activated and keep pushing us to keep moving and, and to survive the, the situation, hopefully. So in nature, that energy is discharged through action. And as I said, with humans, it's not. So in our natural response to fear is to recover fairly quickly. So the parasympathetic nervous system returns to the default. And then over time, the stress hormones are cleared from the bloodstream. So we need to look at what fear does to our mind, okay? It really focuses on ourself, okay? Self-preservation is the whole idea of, of our whole reality when we're in a state of fear, okay? That's the number one priority. We seek control, we want certainty. There's no time to think things through or ask questions. We gotta act right away. So we make quick decisions based on broad categories, everything's safe or unsafe, or, lots of other binary categories that we've created that we get stuck in, that we don't get underneath and understand what's really happening and, and the subtleties and the nuance are just totally disappear. We develop an attitude of win-lose, okay? We're either gonna make it or we're not. It's survival or not survival. And our focus narrows in on threats. And when there's multiple threats, okay, we jump from one to the other and we don't see what's going in between. So we, we miss patterns and we, don't understand relationships and we don't see the whole picture of what's going on. And the other aspect of fear-based thinking is we start thinking in terms of enough. Have I got enough energy to get away from this bear? Is there, is there enough space that I can hide somewhere that he can't get to me? 
Um, so we're always thinking in terms of more, I need more, I need more, I, I'm not good enough, I need to keep going. And so there's this pressure that builds and that keeps on driving us and pushing us. So basically prolonged fear throws us out of balance, okay? Recovery is delayed or forgotten. Uh, the tension just keeps the sympathetic nervous system activated, the stress hormones kick in and go off to the races. So our mind is drawn, as I said, to those potential threats and our emotions become numb or reactive. And when it turns into a habit, when it happens day after day, week after week and months and into years, those patterns get embedded into our body and our brain and our emotions. And the result is fear-based thinking. So let's just back up and put a, a perspective on, on, look at the history of fear, uh, because it's really interesting. There's little evidence from, from my research anyway, and, and the reading that I've done of, of hierarchy or mass violence in the first 95% of human existence. It's only the last six to 10,000 years that there's evidence of those things, okay? And evidence of things that would create fear-based thinking. Now with the discovery of agriculture and there was also a widespread drought throughout the Middle East that led to some to seek power over others and to benefit at their expense. And so that creates a continuing atmosphere of fear uh, when we seek power over others, there's always this fear that they're going to take it back, and they often do. And we, we benefit at someone's expense. We tend to, to hold on to things and, again, worry that they're going to take it back um, and that there's going to be repercussions. So it actually creates fear on both sides because having power over me makes me afraid that they're going to make me do things that they're going to cause problems. And so it just creates this self-escalating process of building tension. So then throughout the, the, the decades and the millennia, uh, war and slavery and conquest, okay, different uh, nations started to form and they tried to take over other nations and succeeded and then they were attacked and, and it just kept on building and building and, and competition kicked into the economic thinking uh, four or 500 years ago and that created its own fear in terms of how to our everyday work and, and what we were doing and and it was started to become part of daily life. And philosophers at that time integrated it into the thinking of, of what was going on. And it's interesting, uh, the main philosophers who, who um, advocated this kind of thinking actually lived in very fearful times where there was a lot going on to be afraid of. Um, and so fast forward into the, into the 20th, late 20th and, and early 21st century, um, this became integrated into media and politics and politicians realized that, that it's a very effective tactic and that when people are stuck in fear-based thinking, they're much easier to, to manipulate and to, you can build a really solid base uh, without a lot of work once you've got someone stuck in fear-based thinking. And then of course, in the last 10 years or so, this is really spread through social media because fear is the best way to get and keep our attention. So the bottom line is we all have fear-based thinking to some extent. Um, it, it's going to vary depending on circumstances for some of us. Some of us are just stuck there, and that's going to be our way of seeing the world and what we believe is reality. Other of us, you know, it depends on the situation. It depends on the issue. Sometimes we can see more clearly other issues. We're just going to get stuck on and react, and we jump right to, the, to, to fear-based thinking. So the characteristics of fear-based thinking can be summarized with this acronym SCANS, with, but there's three Cs. So it's S, C to the third power, A and S, okay? We become more self-centered. We seek control and certainty. There's extensive use of broad categories, particularly binary, either or categories. We develop an adversarial mindset, us versus them, uh, and it's win or lose. Uh, thought becomes narrow and fragmented, and we develop a scarcity mentality. So this is a helpful way to remember fear-based thinking and to recognize it and to realize, well, we need to do something about this, okay? So basically, fear-based thinking keeps us from seeing and thinking clearly. It keeps us from finding lasting solutions to problems, and it creates its own problems, okay? Uh, because we don't see the whole picture and we're reacting in an adversarial mindset. And, and that triggers the adversarial mindset in the opponent. And, and again, we're off to the races. Uh, so we don't see potential or possibilities. We don't understand where the other person's coming from. We miss opportunities that could be used to, 
to work things out and to make progress. The other thing is, is that fear-based thinking gets us stuck in should. And should is a really nasty term, okay? Uh, should implies that there's some kind of an authority that says this is what has to happen. Um, and it's, it's totally unclear. There's no sense of who that authority is necessarily. And it just means that it, it puts immediate pressure. So it's creating stress, creating a threat, creating a demand, um, but not giving us any useful information. So we miss what's realistic and possible in these conditions. We don't think in terms of how does this work? We just think I got to do it. Okay, so then we push ourselves, the focus narrows, and we're on the, we're on the road to fear-based thinking. Um, we'll get into this uh, a little bit more uh, in the next session, but should can be clarified by turning it into if then. So I should do this can be transformed if you say, if I do this, then this will happen. And if I do that, then this will happen. And if I don't do it, then, well, maybe this would happen or that could happen. Okay, now we're on the road to thinking and seeing clearly and, and we can work something out and much more likely to find a solution and must, less likely to create stress and fear. So fear-based thinking makes us vulnerable to manipulation. It creates the conditions where we can be influenced without even our knowledge, okay? We, we become more self-centered. We want certainty and control. So we close our mind to other perspectives. We, we, we buy into blaming and judging people we see as our opponents. Um, we seek leaders who seem strong and decisive without really uh, understanding their take on a lot of the issues necessarily. And actually that's pretty rare in politics that any depth to any issue gets, gets covered in elections anyway. Uh, but we seek leaders that, that we believe will keep us safe. And we also react to labels and categories. And many of these have been very skillfully presented and linked with emotions, particularly fear and disgust, uh, so that it's just automatic. And you can say these terms, and this was all done very intentionally. Uh, there was a whole, uh, Newt Gingrich created a whole structure and system of using labels and categories um, to win elections, to, to, to uh, basically demonize the opponents. Um, we become more defensive and reactive we don't see the big picture or pick up on relevant details. And we'll just accept a simple, simplistic solution. It seems like, okay, it's done. We don't have to think about it anymore because we don't ask questions when we're stuck in fear-based thinking. And we become afraid of losing what we have and, and we see threats where there aren't any. And so we kind of hunker down and, and become defensive and, and worry and create stress. And fear-based thinking also creates resistance to media literacy efforts. Okay, I mean, there, first of all, anything that's labeled by a trusting source um, creates suspicion, and that's already happened. There are, there are people who are speaking out against fear of media literacy uh, because they see it as a threat. Um, and then we get caught up in these media, 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 media silos that provide a, a sense of certainty and control and connection. So they're exactly what we want. We're in a state of fear, uh, but it just feeds the fear-based thinking. And the other thing is that media literacy challenges the sources that a lot of people have used to, that they've built trust and relationships with them over time. And, and so to, and it's, it's really interesting um, when that trust and relationship is, is established, it's hard to question it. And even people uh, who have lost their, their life savings to a con um, still think highly of the, that person in many cases, okay? It, it's, that's what happens in fear-based thinking is you latch on to whatever seems to give us some security. It's hard to let go of that. Um, and we don't ask questions. That's the, the big obstacle in fear-based thinking when you stop asking questions. Curiosity just shrivels up and goes underground. Um, and so asking questions is the key to media literacy. So that that's just doesn't happen. Uh, and also, media literacy undermines simplistic solutions and it creates uncertainty and confusion. So it makes people uncomfortable. So we need to be aware of, to the extent that people are caught up in fear-based thinking and approach it in a way that can gradually enlarge their frames and, and clear their filters and, and shift their focus in different ways. And that usually begins by establishing trust and getting to know how they see things and what's happening. And we'll get into that more uh, in, uh, in session five. So 
Recognizing fear-based thinking allows us to take a step back. We can restore balance and then we can start to think about, okay, what's the big picture? What's going on? What are the details? What are the relationships? Is there a pattern here? How does this person feel about this? What's their perspective? How do they see things? We can start to, to begin to get a clearer picture of, of what's happening and what's needed. Uh, and a potential trap that we have to avoid uh, is uh, accusing someone else of fear-based thinking is really an indication of our own fear-based thinking. Uh, so uh, the first step, and we'll cover this in the, in the next session, uh, the first step in fear-based thinking is, is learning to deal with our own fear-based thinking and learning to, to move past that. Uh, and, and that's really the key to resolving it. So uh, there are a number of steps in, in this, fewer than, than some of the other ones, but there's a couple of articles to read. Uh, one looks at what is truth and just kind of creates a context and some, some food for thought. Uh, there's another kind of summary of, of what fear-based thinking is. And then there's, uh, there's two interactive handouts that uh, uh, just provide some information and some things to, uh, to respond to and, and post your thoughts and comments uh, on the, on the Google Docs that, that's connected to that. So um, please post any questions or comments or thoughts that you have uh, to that forum. And I look forward to, uh, to reading what you're saying and what you're reading, what you write and continuing our conversation uh, on Friday. So thank you, take care.